tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Those of you who know, really know. And those of you who don't, can't imagine. I'd gotten a series of calls from my husband Brian. All unfortunately ignored due to a well-deserved afternoon nap. It wasn't abnormal for him to call me on the way home with little excuses to hear my voice. He'd ask me if I wanted him to pick me up something specific for lunch, or tell me something funny our daughter Kara had done while on their outing. The mind seems to manipulate time under moments of heavy stress or devastation. I called him back after a moment or so, figuring that this time would be no different. Unfortunately for us, it was. The first thing I noticed was the irregularity of the volume of his voice. He seemed trapped between shouting hysterically and trying to whisper as if attempting consideration for other people. I'll remember the conversation until the blissful day I die. He had taken Kara out to a seldom visited community pool 20 miles or so from the house to celebrate the arrival of warmer weather. She wasn't as strong a swimmer as our first two kids, so he liked the privacy of the location as well. It was far enough to give me a little break to rest or catch up on chores and let our little girl feel like her daddy had taken her on a grand adventure. He'd be able to teach her to swim without worrying about drunks passed out on the floats or older children bobbing and splashing around while he taught her to tread water. You get what I mean. Well, as it happens, there were other people there that day. I'm not sure about the specifics, but I decided it didn't matter in the end. Foul play hadn't even entered my mind. Brian had either gotten distracted for a little too long, or had a little too much confidence in our child. Whatever the reason, I know playing the blame game is toxic at this point. The bottom line is Kara was underwater as long as she was because Brian wasn't attentive enough. First, he said she fell. Then he said she was already in the water. Finally, he said he was too upset to remember exactly. Our daughter didn't cry as the top of her head broke clear out of the water's surface. But she didn't rub her eyes or clutch Brian's shoulders in relief. She was unresponsive. He'd been able to perform CPR successfully, he said. And before long, she was gasping through tears as the color returned to her face. He said he'd never been so scared in his life, and he hugged her tightly in a bundle of towels back to the car. If only the call ended there. He drove out of the way to get her ice cream before heading home. He was too wrapped up in guilt to talk to her on the way there. He just left her sleeping peacefully with a makeshift towel headrest in her big girl car seat until they arrived. But when they did, she wouldn't wake up. It's something I think most of us would have done in this situation. I have no idea how close they were to the hospital, or why he didn't scream for help right there, or rush her inside to call an ambulance. But he didn't. He got back in the car and sped to the ER himself. And that's where he was when I called him back. I can't explain the feeling that took hold of me while I drove there. Like I said earlier, those of you who know, really know. And those of you who don't, can't imagine. The essence of time seemed non-existent. The last time I saw my daughter, she was fine. And depending on how quickly or slowly I walked through those hospital doors, that fact held all the difference. I stopped for what could have been a split second or an hour, frozen in place in front of those doors, savoring the insanity of the thought that maybe, if I didn't step inside, nothing would have to change. Brian's back was turned to me. I could see him clearly through the layers of clear glass. He was speaking to a doctor, and the mask covering the lower half of his face hid all inflection of conversation. The moment the doctor met my eyes, it was like a force shoved me through those doors. Before I knew it, I was face to face with the doctor, who told me my daughter was gone. But that's not why I'm telling this story. I'm telling this story because I found a notebook, hidden in Brian's thing sometime later. 
which changed everything. The kind with the spiral side. Brian's history was written across the front cover in bold black letters. My husband had dropped out in 10th grade and over a decade ago at that. I couldn't grasp why the hell he'd keep a history notebook. He was no fan of past or current events in America or anywhere else in the world, really. He said all the news he cared about took place within our four walls. But inside, all the history had taken place within our walls. And it was more than just history. It was everything. Everything since the birth of our first child over 11 years ago. There were details I couldn't even remember. Kindergarten report cards. Christmas shopping receipts. Even stranger things like meal plans. The things we put in their lunch boxes, bedtimes, nap times, when they woke up each day. Page after yellowed page, all scribbled in with a kind of furious urgency for years and years. Brian has always been kind of eccentric. Meticulous, you could even say. Even in his absent-minded sort of way. There's nothing wrong with being detail-oriented. All the bills get paid, appointments get made, and groceries get bought. I've always stopped short of calling him crazy. I've forced myself to be comfortable with it. But this notebook was threatening that. A thick crease in the page held crude family drawings. No artist was my husband. But it was clear who the pictures depicted. Ryan and I like restroom avatars. And the three girls, Amanda, Katie, and Kara, biggest to smallest. Some pictures had Kara cut out. In others, she was drawn in red ink. In one, she was simply crossed out. There were no dates on these pages. Behind them lay Kara's life insurance paperwork, pressed so thin that I nearly missed it. Next, I saw pages with dates that hadn't arrived yet. Home repairs to things that hadn't yet broken. Car payments for vehicles we didn't yet own. Medical bills both things you could plan for and others you couldn't even anticipate. Disasters, both natural and non-natural, with references to continue on some future page. Some impossible plan for a future you could never predict. It all reads like some kind of create-your-own-adventure book, as if by writing it all down, past and future alike, he could control it. And that's what bothered me the most when I saw the family tree he'd drawn. An infantile drawing was done in haste. There were his parents, my parents, our small extended families, and our kids. Nowhere within it did he mention Kara. No date on this page, no telling when he drawn it. Something about that bothered me enough to flip back to the beginning and start again. I checked the dates and looked for inconsistencies. I couldn't remember enough to judge how accurate it all was. But one thing was impossible not to notice. It was the same as our family tree and all the drawings, the plans, and even the unrealized incidents. Instead of three children, Brian only ever acknowledged having two. Anyone who's had a child understands. The highs are extra high and the lows are extra low. I can't even remember the way I felt before Amanda, only that the emotional levels had much tighter margins. My pride watching her graduate kindergarten was so much prouder than I've ever felt and the doom seeing the soaring number on the thermometer when she had the flu was that much darker. When you're a parent, you're as vulnerable as you are empowered. If you've had a child, you understand. You'd assume so, anyway. Things never seemed to resonate with Brian the way they did with me. He must have felt it, but he never really showed it. I'm not saying he was a bad father. I know that's just toxic at this point. Only that things didn't affect him the way they did me. Also, it was clear he had his preferences. Katie was always daddy's girl, our second child. I could see him staying up for Katie if she had the flu. But earlier on with Amanda, those highs and lows just didn't seem to register. At the time, I thought he was still adjusting to being a dad. And when Katie showed up, it looked like he'd gotten the hang of it. But when Kara showed up, it was like Amanda all over again. And all the while, he'd been scribbling in this secret notebook of his. Inspiring. Chronicling everything that suited him and ignoring everything that didn't. Past, present, and future. I had no idea at the time, of course. Not until Kara died. 
But there were other things. For as long as I could remember, Brian would have a couple drinks with dinner. I never thought much of it. But the two drinks would sometimes become four after Kara was born. Along with this, I noticed other patterns. And they were patterns. Little things. Things that never really occurred to me. How Brian would never pick up a single french fry, for example. Always two. Sometimes four. But never three. I know it sounds silly, and they were things never worth mentioning. And I didn't mention them, not for quite some time. Not until the night when Kara was sick, and it was clear he wasn't feeling the same doom I was feeling. He had just poured a third drink, and I knew that meant a fourth was coming. I guess you're not planning to get up tonight if Kara needs you. I was doing more than just belittling him just then. I was threatening his fourth drink, and he knew it. And the look he gave me said as much. She'll be fine, he said. She's got a little cold. What difference does it make? But I couldn't help myself. I think three of those will be enough, I said. And I'm ashamed to admit it. But at the time, it was more about the number than it was about Kara. I could take care of Kara myself. The predictability bothered me. That I could sense what he was doing even then. I'd find, nearly a year later, that he was keeping it to himself like some dark secret. Like the notebook. The idea that the number would take precedence over everything else if it came down to it. Even the darkness of a sick child. He stood from the table and left without a word. I stayed up with Kara that night, and cradled her in her room until her sniffles ceased and she fell asleep. The whiskey bottle had a good chunk taken out of it in the morning. My guess was eight drinks. Can't say I was surprised. From that night on, I paid more attention than ever. Never bringing it up, but quietly taking note of every idiosyncrasy. It was almost like whatever sickness he had was infecting me as well. Other than that, everything seemed fine. He did what he did, in his Brian sort of way. And we all continued as directed. But there were patterns. Things so obvious, yet so obscure you'd never notice them unless you were paying close attention. I questioned my sanity more than once. Though I might have been projecting these things where they didn't exist. Was I the crazy one here? No, I wasn't. There were just too many of them. Sure, there are coincidences. But coincidences never apply to everything. And everything happened in twos. Everything was an even number. No odd number could stand without being amended. It had always been that way. I just hadn't noticed. I had always known he went to bed around midnight, but never realized it was exactly midnight. I had always known he got up around eight, but only now realize it was exactly eight. He had two eggs for breakfast, two pieces of toast, two cups of coffee. He brushed his teeth for two minutes, always glancing at the clock to make sure. Two squirts of soap when he washed his hands. Two rings before he picked up the phone. And when two wasn't enough, it was four. And when four wasn't enough, it was six. And I never opened my mouth. Not a word. Not since that night with the drinks. But for all that was bubbling underneath, we were a perfectly normal family to the outside eye. A family of five. It was dark in our house after Kara died. The kind of darkness you can only understand if you've lost a child. If you haven't, you just can't imagine. If Brian had been withdrawn before, he was all the more so now. Even when it came to Katie. I was on my own when it came to consoling them. Not easy when you're in such pain yourself. There were no dinners for a while. But that didn't stop Brian from drinking. Naturally, four or six drinks became eight or ten. Time heals all wounds, they say. But old habits die hard. And even after a few months, when our routine started to return to normal, the drinks kept flowing. Only then was I able to go through Kara's things. I put them away but couldn't convince myself to throw them out. I doubted I ever could. Brian would ask me if I blamed him for what happened from time to time. I didn't, told him. What good would it do if I did? We still had a family to maintain. A family of four and there was no sense tearing apart what we still had left. 
It wasn't long after that when I found the notebook. I put it back exactly as it had been, after that first look, but returned to read it again after Brian had fallen asleep. This time I was reading it from a different perspective. Not as a mourning mother, an unsettled wife, but more analytically. I was reading with the same sickness Brian had given me, reading through Brian's eyes. It was unmistakable when you saw things his way. There could be only four of us when you took on this latent illness and let it seep through your bloodstream just enough to understand it. Only for the hope of another did he tolerate Amanda, and Katie came almost immediately. For four and a half years, he was stuck at drink three. Stuck at three rings. Our family tree itself threatened to lean over and snap at the trunk. And suddenly we were back at four. Even more suddenly, I was pregnant. Things were as normal as you can expect by the time June came along. Another girl. Amanda and Katie were over the moon about it. Ryan tried to be, but I knew better. Knowing what I knew, I could sense how it affected him deep down in his every movement, in his every expression. At the same time, though, I could see him trying his best. Of course, it all went unsaid, but Brian's new tact was plain to see. June was a stroke of luck, our first and somewhat drunken coupling since the day we lost Kara. And it wasn't long after she was born that my husband found his newfound enthusiasm for kids. Hey, I was thinking. He said one night while we lay in bed. It was 11.30. June was in her basket on the floor by my bedside. I had just finished nursing her. Yeah. How about we have one more? He said. Four's a good number, isn't it? Nice, even number. You really want a boy, don't you? I asked. Of course I knew this wasn't the issue. Nah, I like my girls. I mean, a boy would be fine too, of course. Hey, it's up to you. Whatever you feel like making, you know? He leaned over and nuzzled my neck the way he does. He stopped at four drinks that night. I was half expecting this in the first place. Maybe it was that latent illness he'd infected me with. Maybe I just knew him that well. I've had plenty of time to think since Kara died. Plenty of time to worry. Plenty of time to consider things. I never did sneak off to read Brian's notebook again. I didn't think that was necessary. If our family was going to work, we had a short list of options to make that happen. And this was certainly one of them. Easier said than done, of course. Number four was nowhere near as urgent as number three. We tried that night. We tried on many nights. We were still trying as June took her first steps. Ryan's four drinks turned back to six, and six turned back to eight. I could feel it in my gut when he was down there scribbling in his notebook again. I never bothered to check. I just knew. I can imagine him down there crunching numbers, trying to justify things to reconcile his illness to reality, trying to find some way to hold up three fingers and see four. It couldn't have been easy for him. But if intuition told me anything, there wouldn't be a number four. It would only be scribbling. It would only be suffering. And something bad was going to happen. Years went by, as they are wont to do. Amanda and Katie were fully teenagers now and immersed in their own lives. June was three and a half. An amazing girl, full of personality and energy. Mummy's gift. Being a mom wasn't getting any easier, but I kept up with all the playdates and activities the best I could. Brian was Brian. Still trying, but being Brian wasn't getting any easier either. Still, we remained our family of five. We hadn't spoken about Kara in weeks, although the anniversary of her death was fast approaching. Time does heal all wounds. Wounds do heal. But the scars are forever. Why don't you take a day off? Brian said. You've been going non-stop. Can't, I said. You've got your appointment at three and June's got pottery class at two. Not today. You just have a day for yourself, and I'll take June somewhere. How about Friday? You can relax, and we'll go out and have a good time somewhere. You deserve it. Where were you thinking? It's gonna be hot Friday. I could take her to the pool, maybe. You'd think he completely forgot the way he was looking at me. Add to that. Kara's last day at the pool was only days away. There was a pause, but I kept a straight face. The pool? She loves swimming. She'll have a great time. I'll take her out for ice cream afterward. 
You can relax for the day and everything will be fine. What do you think? Again I paused, just waiting for him to mention Kara. Whether it was purposeful or willful ignorance, the thought never seemed to cross his mind. No, don't worry, I know what you're thinking. Or any other kind of consolation. Nothing. Just another summer day at the pool. All right, I said. It was all I could think to say. Thursday night, Katie and Amanda were spending the night with friends. Brian brought home takeout and had the usual six or eight drinks, which had evolved to doubles for convenience. June was in bed by eight, so I had a rare couple of drinks myself. A quiet night at the house. We watched a little TV for a while. Then Brian, barely able to balance his glass on the arm of the couch, told me he was going upstairs to take a bath. I knew he would. It's the same thing he did every Thursday night. There's no variation in Brian's schedule. I guess you've figured that out by now. He stumbled his way upstairs and I went off to the liquor cart to pour myself another. Just one. And after the water turned off, I heard him climb into the tub. I appended my drink and went upstairs myself. I went into the closet and took out the negligee I'd picked up. And for a gal with three kids, which should have been four, I've still got what it takes to wear it. A bit out of character for me, at least these days. But I knew what Brian liked. I slipped out of my knocking around the house wear and put it on. I checked myself in the dressing mirror and peeked into June's room before going into the bathroom. Fast asleep, snoring soundly. Brian's eyes went wide when he saw me standing in the doorway. He nearly tipped his glass into the tub but caught it just in time. I was glad about that. Oh, hey. He chuckled. <laughs> Where'd you get that? That's what you're interested in? Where I got it? <laughs> Not really. This old thing? I pushed the straps off my shoulders and shimmied out of it. He always did know just where and how to touch me. I imagined it being the only thing I missed about him. Just barely even then. I tried looking into his eyes as I climbed on top of him, searching for the smallest sign of the wonder they used to hold at my naked body. There was none. Just the eyes of a man who can see past anything to have his way, and the cocky smile of a control freak. Nonetheless, I still allowed myself a moment of joy, feeling his arms around me as we became one. Like old times, when it was just the two of us. There was no hunger or urgency, just a swollen feeling of self-contentment, like taking your tightest bra off after a long day of work. We made a rhythm with the lapping water until he had nothing left to give. <laughs> Here's to pleasant surprises, he said reaching for his glass by the soap dish. I could see him checking the clock on the wall, reconciling himself to those gods of evenness. How many was it? I wanted to ask him. I know you were counting. I know everything. I know what you write in your book. I know what you did at the pool that day. And I know what you're planning next. Here's to surprises, I agreed. And I wrapped my hands around his throat and plunged him into the water. He'd still been panting when I did it, and that panic was immediate. He thrashed underneath me and clawed at my wrists, but I bore down with all the strength of a mother bereaved. My hands were vices and my fingers were claws. Even as he dwindled inside me, I wrapped my legs under his and squeezed with everything I had. His screams came out in muffled globs of air that broke into ineffective bubbles. Only the sloshing water and squeak of skin on slippery ceramic as the acid burned in my arms and legs, and my strength threatened to give out, so did he. And before long, he ceased to move altogether. The clock on the wall said midnight. We're back to a family of four now. Ryan would be happy about that if he were still around. But one of us was the odd one out, and one of us had to get even. You can take that any way you want to. I don't think it makes a difference at this point. It turns out hundreds of people drown in their bathtubs each year. Not nearly as many as in swimming pools, but it happens more than you think. With alcohol a major contributor. Tragedies will inevitably happen. The most you can do is try your best to prevent them. It was dark around the house for a while. I allowed the evenness, the symmetry of everything Brian touched on to fall into disorder. 
I encouraged it, to be honest. You might even accuse me of developing a similar illness if you were paying attention. But that wasn't it. To me, it was no more than house cleaning. Purging our home of this evil spirit. Banishing whatever gods Brian incessantly sought to please. Even at the expense of our daughter. And so went his Bible into a hole I dug in the backyard. I'd never had much time for gardening with all the kids and their activities. But I prefer to keep things less regimented these days. I did away with most of the clocks in the house, and I'm sure you know which one came down first. Who puts a clock in the bathroom anyway? June helps me out in the garden. The flowers we planted over Brian's moldering and miserable notebook are random, haphazard, and deliberately odd in number. I'm sure that would drive him crazy. But Brian is at peace now, and so are we. There's peace in the natural order of things, I think, and there's nothing more beautiful than that. Chilling tales for dark nights.